It was not only Britain's position on the world stage that was at risk. Napoleon threatened to invade Britain itself, just as his armies had overrun many countries of continental Europe. The Napoleonic Wars were therefore ones in which Britain invested large amounts of capital and resources to win. French ports were blockaded by the Royal Navy, which won a decisive victory over a French Imperial Navy Spanish Navy fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. Overseas colonies were attacked and occupied, including those of the Netherlands, which was annexed by Napoleon in 1810. France was finally defeated by a coalition of European armies in 1815. Britain was again the beneficiary of peace treaties. France ceded the Ionian Islands, Malta, which it had occupied in 1798, Mauritius, St. Lucia, Seychelles, and Tobago. Spain ceded Trinidad. The Netherlands ceded Guiana, Ceylon, and the Cape Colony, while the Danish ceded Heligoland. Britain returned Guadeloupe, Martinique, French Guiana, and Reunion to France, Menorca to Spain, Danish West Indies to Denmark and Java and Suriname to the Netherlands. With the advent of the Industrial Revolution, goods produced by slavery became less important to the British economy. Added to this was the cost of suppressing regular slave rebellions. With support from the British abolitionist movement, Parliament enacted the Slave Trade Act in 1807, which abolished the slave trade in the empire. In 1808, Sierra Leone colony was designated an official British colony for freed slaves. Parliamentary reform in 1832 saw the influence of the West India Committee decline. The Slavery Abolition Act passed the following year, abolished slavery in the British Empire on August 1, 1834, finally bringing the empire into line with the law in the UK. Under the Act, slaves were granted full emancipation after a period of four to six years of apprenticeship. Facing further opposition from abolitionists, the apprenticeship system was abolished in 1838. The British government compensated slave owners. Between 1815 and 1914, a period referred to as Britain's imperial century by some historians, around 10 million square miles, 26 million square kilometers, of territory and roughly 400 million people were added to the British Empire. Victory over Napoleon left Britain without any serious international rival other than Russia and Central Asia. Unchallenged at sea, Britain adopted the role of global policeman a state of affairs later known as the Pax Britannica and a foreign policy of splendid isolation. Alongside the formal control it exerted over its own colonies, Britain's dominant position in world trade meant that it effectively controlled the economies of many countries, such as China, Argentina, and Siam, which has been described by some historians as an informal empire. The East India Company drove the expansion of the British Empire in Asia. The company's army had first joined forces with the Royal Navy during the Seven Years' War, and the two continued to cooperate in arenas outside India. The eviction of the French from Egypt, 1799, the capture of Java from the Netherlands, 1811, the acquisition of Penang Island, 1786, Singapore, 1819, and Malacca, 1824, and the defeat of Burma, 1826. From its base in India, the company had been engaged in an increasingly profitable opium export trade to Qing China since the 1730s. This trade, illegal since it was outlawed by China in 1729, helped reverse the trade imbalances resulting from the British imports of tea, which saw large outflows of silver from Britain to China. In 1839, the confiscation by the Chinese authorities at Canton of 20,000 chests of opium led Britain to attack China in the First Opium War and resulted in the seizure by Britain of Hong Kong Island, at that time a minor settlement, and other treaty ports including Shanghai. During the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the British crown began to assume an increasingly large role in the affairs of the company. A series of acts of parliament were passed, including the Regulating Act of 1773, Pitt's India Act of 1784, and the Charter Act of 1813, which regulated the company's affairs and established the sovereignty of the crown over the territories that it had acquired. The company's eventual end was precipitated by the Indian Rebellion in 1857, a conflict that had begun with the mutiny of sepoys, Indian troops under British officers, and discipline. The rebellion took six months to suppress, with heavy loss of life on both sides. The following year, the British government dissolved the company and assumed direct control over India through the Government of India Act 1858, establishing the British Raj, 
where an appointed governor general administered India and Queen Victoria was crowned the Empress of India. India became the empire's most valuable possession, the jewel in the crown, and was the most important source of Britain's strength. A series of serious crop failures in the late 19th century led to widespread famines on the subcontinent in which it is estimated that over 15 million people died. The East India Company had failed to implement any coordinated policy to deal with the famines during its period of rule. Later, under direct British rule, commissions were set up after each famine to investigate the causes and implement new policies, which took until the early 1900s to have an effect. During the 19th century, Britain and the Russian Empire vied to fill the power vacuums that had been left by the declining Ottoman Empire, Qajar Dynasty, and Qing Dynasty. This rivalry in Central Asia came to be known as the Great Game. As far as Britain was concerned, defeats inflicted by Russia on Persia and Turkey demonstrated its imperial ambitions and capabilities and stoked fears in Britain of an overland invasion of India. In 1839, Britain moved to preempted this by invading Afghanistan, but the first Anglo-Afghan war was a disaster for Britain. When Russia invaded the Ottoman Balkans in 1853, Fears of Russian dominance in the Mediterranean and the Middle East led Britain and France to enter the war in support of the Ottoman Empire and invade the Crimean Peninsula to destroy Russian naval capabilities. The ensuing Crimean War, 1854-1856, which involved new techniques of modern warfare, was the only global war fought between Britain and another imperial power during the Pax Britannica and was a resounding defeat for Russia. The situation remained unresolved in Central Asia for two more decades, with Britain annexing Baluchistan in 1876 and Russia annexing Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, and Turkmenistan. For a while, it appeared that another war would be inevitable, but the two countries reached an agreement on their respective spheres of influence in the region in 1878 and all outstanding matters in 1907 with the signing of the Anglo-Russian Entente. The destruction of the Imperial Russian Navy by the Imperial Japanese Navy at the Battle of Tsushima during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905 limited its threat to the British. The Dutch East India Company had founded the Dutch Cape Colony on the southern tip of Africa in 1652 as a way station for its ships traveling to and from its colonies in the East Indies. Britain formally acquired the colony and its large Afrikaner, or Boer, population in 1806 having occupied it in 1795 to prevent its falling into French hands during the Flanders Campaign. British immigration to the Cape Colony began to rise after 1820 and pushed thousands of Boers, resentful of British rule, northwards to found their own, mostly short-lived independent republics, during the great trek of the late 1830s and early 1840s. In the process, the Vortrekkers clashed repeatedly with the British, who had their agenda about colonial expansion in South Africa into the various native African polities, including those of the Sotho people and the Zulu kingdom. Eventually, the Boers established two republics that had a longer lifespan, the South African Republic or the Transvaal Republic, 1852 to 1877, 1881 to 1902, and the Orange Free State, 1854 to 1902. In 1902, Britain occupied both republics, concluding a treaty with the two Boer republics following the Second Boer War, 1899-1902. In 1869, the Suez Canal opened under Napoleon III, linking the Mediterranean Sea with the Indian Ocean. Initially, the canal was opposed by the British, but once opened, its strategic value was quickly recognized and became the jugular vein of the empire. In 1875, the conservative government of Benjamin Disraeli bought the indebted Egyptian ruler Ismail Pasha's 44% shareholding in the Suez Canal for £4 million. Although this did not grant outright control of the strategic waterway, it did give Britain leverage. Joint Anglo-French financial control over Egypt ended in outright British occupation in 1882. Although Britain controlled the Khedive of Egypt into the 20th century, it was officially a vassal state of the Ottoman Empire and not part of the British Empire. The French were still majority shareholders and attempted to weaken the British position, but a compromise was reached with the 1888 Convention of Constantinople, which made the canal officially neutral territory. With competitive French, Belgian, and Portuguese activity in the lower Congo River region undermining orderly colonization of tropical Africa, the Berlin Conference of 1884-85 was held to regulate the competition between the European powers in what was called the Scramble for Africa 
by defining effective occupation. As the criterion for international recognition of territorial claims, the scramble continued into the 1890s and caused Britain to reconsider its decision in 1885 to withdraw from Sudan. A joint force of British and Egyptian troops defeated the Mahdiist army in 1896 and rebuffed an attempted French invasion at Fassad in 1898. Sudan was nominally made an Anglo-Egyptian condominium, but a British colony in reality. British gains in Southern and East Africa prompted Cecil Rhodes, pioneer of British expansion in Southern Africa, to urge a Cape to Cairo railway linking the strategically important Suez Canal to the mineral-rich south of the continent. During the 1880s and 1890s, Rhodes, with his privately owned British South Africa Company, occupied and annexed territories named after him, Rhodesia. The path to independence for the white colonies of the British Empire began with the 1839 Durham Report, which proposed unification and self-government for Upper and Lower Canada, as a solution to political unrest which had erupted in armed rebellions in 1837. This began with the passing of the Act of Union in 1840, which created the province of Canada. The responsible government was first granted to Nova Scotia in 1848 and was soon extended to the other British North American colonies. With the passage of the British North America Act of 1867 by the British Parliament, the provinces of Canada, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia were formed into Canada, a confederation enjoying full self-government except international relations, Australia and New Zealand achieved similar levels of self-government after 1900, with the Australian colonies federating in 1901. The term, Dominion Status, was officially introduced at the 1907 Imperial Conference. As the Dominions gained greater autonomy, they would come to be recognized as distinct realms of the empire with unique customs and symbols of their own. Imperial identity, through imagery such as patriotic artworks and banners, began developing into a form that attempted to be more inclusive by showcasing the empire as a family of newly birthed nations with common roots. The last decades of the 19th century saw concerted political campaigns for Irish home rule. Ireland had been united with Britain into the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland with the Act of Union 1800 after the Irish Rebellion of 1798 and had suffered a severe famine between 1845 and 1852. Home rule was supported by the British Prime Minister, William Gladstone, who hoped that Ireland might follow in Canada's footsteps as a dominion within the empire, but his 1886 Home Rule Bill was defeated in Parliament. Although the bill, if passed, would have granted Ireland less autonomy within the UK than the Canadian provinces had within their federation, many MPs feared that a partially independent Ireland might pose a security threat to Great Britain or mark the beginning of the breakup of the empire. A second Home Rule Bill was defeated for similar reasons. A third bill was passed by Parliament in 1914, but not implemented because of the outbreak of the First World War leading to the 1916 Easter Rising. Britain's fears of war with Germany were realized in 1914 with the outbreak of the First World War. Britain quickly invaded and occupied most of Germany's overseas colonies in Africa. In the Pacific, Australia and New Zealand occupied German New Guinea and German Samoa respectively. Plans for a post-war division of the Ottoman Empire, which had joined the war on Germany's side, were secretly drawn up by Britain and France under the 1916 Sykes-Picot Agreement. This agreement was not divulged to the Sharif of Mecca, whom the British had been encouraging to launch an Arab revolt against their Ottoman rulers, giving the impression that Britain was supporting the creation of an independent Arab state. The British declaration of war on Germany and its allies committed the colonies and dominions, which provided invaluable military, financial, and material support. Over 2.5 million men served in the armies of the dominions, as well as many thousands of volunteers from the Crown colonies. The contributions of Australian and New Zealand troops during the 1915 Gallipoli campaign against the Ottoman Empire had a great impact on the national consciousness at home and marked a watershed in the transition of Australia and New Zealand from colonies to nations in their own right. The countries continue to commemorate this occasion on Anzac Day. Canadians viewed the Battle of Vim Ridge in a similar light. The important contribution of the Dominions to the war effort was recognized in 1917 by British Prime Minister David Lloyd George when he invited each of the Dominion Prime Ministers to join an Imperial War Cabinet to coordinate Imperial policy. Under the terms of the concluding Treaty of Versailles signed in 1919, 
The empire reached its greatest extent with the addition of 1.8 million square miles, 4.7 million square kilometers, and 13 million new subjects. The colonies of Germany and the Ottoman Empire were distributed to the Allied powers as League of Nations mandates. Britain gained control of Palestine, Transjordan, Iraq, parts of Cameroon and Togoland, and Tanganyika. The dominions themselves acquired mandates of their own. The Union of South Africa gained Southwest Africa, Australia gained New Guinea, and New Zealand Western Samoa. Nauru was made a combined mandate of Britain and the two Pacific dominions. The changing world order that the war had brought about, in particular, the growth of the United States and Japan as naval powers, and the rise of independence movements in India and Ireland, caused a major reassessment of British imperial policy. Forced to choose between alignment with the United States or Japan, Britain opted not to renew its Anglo-Japanese alliance, and instead signed the 1922 Washington Naval Treaty, where Britain accepted naval parity with the United States. This decision was the source of much debate in Britain during the 1930s as militaristic governments took hold in Germany and Japan helped in part by the Great Depression, for it was feared that the empire could not survive a simultaneous attack by both nations. The issue of the empire's security was a serious concern in Britain, as it was vital to the British economy. In 1919, the frustrations caused by delays to Irish home rule led the MPs of Sinn Féin, a pro-independence party that had won a majority of the Irish seats in the 1918 British general election, to establish an independent parliament in Dublin at which Irish independence was declared. The Irish Republican Army simultaneously began a guerrilla war against the British administration. The Irish War of Independence ended in 1921 with a stalemate and the signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty, creating the Irish Free State, a dominion within the British Empire, with effective internal independence but still constitutionally linked with the British Crown. Northern Ireland, consisting of six of the 32 Irish counties that had been established as a devolved region under the 1920 Government of Ireland Act, immediately exercised its option under the treaty to retain its existing status within the United Kingdom. A similar struggle began in India when the Government of India Act 1919 failed to satisfy the demand for independence. Concerns over communist and foreign plots following the Gadar conspiracy ensured that wartime strictures were renewed by the Rowlett Acts. This led to tension, particularly in the Punjab region, where repressive measures culminated in the Amritsar massacre. In Britain, public opinion was divided over the morality of the massacre between those who saw it as having saved India from anarchy and those who viewed it with revulsion. The non-cooperation movement was called off in March 1922 following the Chayuri Chowra incident, and discontent continued to simmer for the next 25 years. In 1922, Egypt, which had been declared a British protectorate at the outbreak of the First World War, was granted formal independence, though it continued to be a British client state until 1954. British troops remained stationed in Egypt until the signing of the Anglo-Egyptian Treaty in 1936, under which it was agreed that the troops would withdraw but continue to occupy and defend the Suez Canal Zone. In return, Egypt was assisted in joining the League of Nations. Iraq, a British mandate since 1920, gained membership in the League in its own right after achieving independence from Britain in 1932. In Palestine, Britain was presented with the problem of mediating between the Arabs and increasing numbers of Jews. The Balfour Declaration, which had been incorporated into the terms of the mandate, stated that a national home for the Jewish people would be established in Palestine, and Jewish immigration allowed up to a limit that would be determined by the mandatory power. This led to increasing conflict with the Arab population, who openly revolted in 1936. As the threat of war with Germany increased during the 1930s, Britain judged the support of Arabs as more important than the establishment of a Jewish homeland and shifted to a pro-Arab stance, limiting Jewish immigration and in turn triggering a Jewish insurgency. The right of the Dominions to set their foreign policy independent of Britain, was recognized at the 1923 Imperial Conference. Britain's request for military assistance from the Dominions at the outbreak of the Chanuk Crisis the previous year had been turned down by Canada and South Africa, and Canada had refused to be bound by the 1923 Treaty of Lausanne. After pressure from the Irish Free State in South Africa, the 1926 Imperial Conference issued the Balfour Declaration of 1926, declaring Britain and the Dominions to be autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status, 
in no way subordinate one to another within a British Commonwealth of Nations. This declaration was given legal substance under the 1931 Statute of Westminster. The Parliaments of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the Union of South Africa, the Irish Free State, and Newfoundland were now independent of British legislative control, they could nullify British laws and Britain could no longer pass laws for them without their consent. Newfoundland reverted to colonial status in 1933, suffering from financial difficulties during the Great Depression. In 1937, the Irish Free State introduced a Republican constitution renaming itself Ireland. Britain's declaration of war against Nazi Germany in September 1939 included the Crown Colonies and India but did not automatically commit the dominions of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Newfoundland, and South Africa. All soon declared war on Germany. While Britain continued to regard Ireland as still within the British Commonwealth, Ireland chose to remain legally neutral throughout the war. After the fall of France in June 1940, Britain and the Empire stood alone against Germany until the German invasion of Greece on April 7, 1941. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill successfully lobbied President Franklin D. Roosevelt for military aid from the United States, but Roosevelt was not yet ready to ask Congress to commit the country to war. In August 1941, Churchill and Roosevelt met and signed the Atlantic Charter, which included the statement that the rights of all peoples to choose the form of government under which they live should be respected. This wording was ambiguous as to whether it referred to European countries invaded by Germany and Italy, or the peoples colonized by European nations, and would later be interpreted differently by the British, Americans, and nationalist movements. For Churchill, the entry of the United States into the war was the greatest joy. He felt that Britain was now assured of victory, but failed to recognize that the many disasters, immeasurable costs and tribulations, which he knew lay ahead in December 1941, would have permanent consequences for the future of the empire. How British forces were rapidly defeated in the Far East irreversibly harmed Britain's standing and prestige as an imperial power, including, particularly, the fall of Singapore, which had previously been hailed as an impregnable fortress and the eastern equivalent of Gibraltar. The realization that Britain could not defend its entire empire pushed Australia and New Zealand, which now appeared threatened by Japanese forces, into closer ties with the United States and, ultimately, the 1951 ANZUS Pact. The war weakened the empire in other ways, undermining Britain's control of politics in India, inflicting long-term economic damage, and irrevocably changing geopolitics by pushing the Soviet Union and the United States to the center of the global stage. Though Britain and the empire emerged victorious from the Second World War, the effects of the conflict were profound, both at home and abroad. Much of Europe, a continent that had dominated the world for several centuries, was in ruins and host to the armies of the United States and the Soviet Union, who now held the balance of global power. Britain was left essentially bankrupt, with insolvency only averted in 1946 after the negotiation of a 3.75 billion US dollar loan from the United States, the last installment of which was repaid in 2006. At the same time, anti-colonial movements were on the rise in the colonies of European nations. The situation was complicated further by the increasing Cold War rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. In principle, both nations were opposed to European colonialism. In practice, American anti-communism prevailed over anti-imperialism, and therefore the United States supported the continued existence of the British Empire to keep communist expansion in check. At first, British politicians believed it would be possible to maintain Britain's role as a world power at the head of a reimagined Commonwealth, but by 1960 they were forced to recognize that there was an irresistible wind of change blowing. Their priorities changed to maintaining an extensive zone of British influence and ensuring that stable, non-communist governments were established in former colonies. While other European powers such as France and Portugal waged costly and unsuccessful wars to keep their empires intact, Britain generally adopted a policy of peaceful disengagement from its colonies, although violence occurred in Malaya, Kenya, and Palestine. Between 1945 and 1965, the number of people under British rule outside the UK itself fell from 700 million to 5 million, 3 million of whom were in Hong Kong. The pro-decolonization Labour government, elected at the 1945 general election and led by Clement Attlee, 
moved quickly to tackle the most pressing issue facing the empire, Indian independence. 193. India's two major political parties, the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League, led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, had been campaigning for independence for decades but disagreed as to how it should be implemented. Congress favored a unified secular Indian state, whereas the League, fearing dominance by the Hindu majority, desired a separate Islamic state for Muslim majority regions. Increasing civil unrest and the mutiny of the Royal Indian Navy in 1946 led Atli to promise independence no later than June 30, 1948. When the urgency of the situation and risk of civil war became apparent, the newly appointed and last Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, hastily brought forward the date to August 15, 1947. The borders drawn by the British to broadly partition India into Hindu and Muslim areas left tens of millions as minorities in the newly independent states of India and Pakistan. Millions of Muslims crossed from India to Pakistan and Hindus vice versa, and violence between the two communities cost hundreds of thousands of lives. Burma, which had been administered as part of British India until 1937, and Sri Lanka gained their independence the following year in 1948. India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka became members of the Commonwealth, while Burma chose not to join. That same year, the British Nationality Act was enacted, in hopes of strengthening and unifying the Commonwealth. It provided British citizenship and the right of entry to all those living within its jurisdiction. The British Mandate in Palestine, where an Arab majority lived alongside a Jewish minority, presented the British with a similar problem to that of India. The matter was complicated by large numbers of Jewish refugees seeking to be admitted to Palestine following the Holocaust, while Arabs were opposed to the creation of a Jewish state. Frustrated by the intractability of the problem, attacks by Jewish paramilitary organizations, and the increasing cost of maintaining its military presence, Britain announced in 1947 that it would withdraw in 1948 and leave the matter to the United Nations to solve. The UN General Assembly subsequently voted for a plan to partition Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state. It was immediately followed by the outbreak of a civil war between the Arabs and Jews of Palestine, and British forces withdrew amid the fighting. The British mandate for Palestine officially terminated at midnight on May 15, 1948, as the State of Israel declared independence, and the 1948 Arab-Israeli War broke out, during which the territory of the former mandate was partitioned between Israel and the surrounding Arab states. Amid the fighting, British forces continued to withdraw from Israel, with the last British troops departing from Haifa on June 30, 1948. Following the surrender of Japan in the Second World War, anti-Japanese resistance movements in Malaya turned their attention towards the British, who had moved to quickly retake control of the colony, valuing it as a source of rubber and tin. The fact that the guerrillas were primarily Malaysian Chinese communists meant that the British attempt to quell the uprising was supported by the Muslim Malay majority, on the understanding that once the insurgency had been quelled, independence would be granted. The Malayan Emergency, as it was called, began in 1948 and lasted until 1960, but by 1957, 